Aloha and welcome to today's national ANA webinar introducing two new ANA FOAs, ILEAD and NLCC, a resource of the Administration for Native Americans. Today is Thursday, March 31st, 2016, and it is currently 3 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, so this session is being uh, presented by the Pacific Region TTA Center. Um, we are one of four regional TTA centers serving Native communities um, that uh, work with and apply for grants from the Administration for Native Americans. Um, my name is Matthew Ng. You see me there on the far right of this photo, along with the rest of our regional staff members. Um, and we exist to offer training and technical assistance to all the members um, of Native communities in the Pacific. Um, to learn more about, about our company, you can visit our website, www.anapacificbasin.org. Um, so this webinar is a resource of the Administration for Native Americans. Um, ANA promotes self-sufficiency for Native Americans by providing discretionary grant funding for community-based projects and training and technical assistance to eligible tribes and Native organizations. And ANA's vision is that all Native communities are thriving. Um, so, for uh, today, we're going to be talking about two new ANA funding initiatives, um, which will be due later. Um, which will be due later. But I just wanted to start by reminding everyone that um, ANA's existing uh, funding opportunities are going to be due very soon on April 6, two thousand sixteen, um, at eleven fifty nine p.m. Eastern Time. And so if you're applying for any of ANA's existing um, grants, that would be SEDS, SEEDS, um, Language p &M, Language EMI, or ERE grants, then um, please be reminded that your grants are due very soon. Um, and if you need any help with that, please contact your regional TTA centers, and they'd be glad to help you with your application. Um, for more information about ANA's existing funding opportunity announcements, um, please visit the webpage on their website, uh, which you see down there below, um, www.acf.hhs.gov slash programs slash ANA slash grants slash funding opportunities. Um, so for today's webinar, um, what we are looking at are the two new um, funding opportunities that ANA has published. And our objective is to understand the details in these recently published FOAs. Um, first, we're going to start with a general overview. And um, we um, are lucky enough to have uh, Commissioner Lillian Sparks Robinson um, joining us today to provide the background on the events that led up to the creation of these FOAs and, um, you know, the direction that it represents for ANA. Um, and then we'll feature um, Mia Strickland, the Director of the Division for Program Operations, who will lead us through the details of the new um, ILEAD and NLCC uh, funding opportunity announcements. Uh, then we'll have a short question and answer section where you'll be able to type in your um, questions into the chat box to the right, um, and then we'll close the session and give you some additional resources to consider. Um, and so to start off this session, we'd like to um, feature the commissioner of the Administration for Native Americans, Lillian Sparks Robinson. Um, Lillian Sparks Robinson is a Lakota woman of the Rosebud and Oglala Sioux tribes and the commissioner of ANA. Uh, Ms. Sparks Robinson was confirmed by the United States Senate as the commissioner on March 3rd, 2010, and was sworn in on March 5th. She's devoted her career to supporting the educational pursuits of Native American students, protecting the rights of indigenous people, and empowering tribal communities. 
Named one of seven young Native American leaders by USA Today magazine, Mrs. Sparks Robinson received her BA in political science from Morgan State University, located in her hometown of Baltimore, Maryland, and her JD from Georgetown University in Washington, DC. We are honored to have Commissioner Sparks Robinson here with us today to give us a little background on the events that led up to the pub publication of these two new and exciting ANA funding opportunities. So without further, further ado, um, Here's the commissioner. Thanks so much, Matt, for that introduction. And for those that are looking at the slides, that is my 19-month-old son, Connor Jacob Robinson, sitting on my lap. Um, we were able to take those pictures just a few days ago while all of the staff took photos in our offices. And so um, for those that saw me when I was pregnant and then saw me again last year's a grand team meeting, this is probably the most recent photo of my son. So thanks for including that, Matt. Good morning or good afternoon to all of you. Uh, as mentioned, I am still the Commissioner for Administration for Native Americans. And I'm really excited about our two new fellows that we are announcing and sharing information with you uh, about today. So um, the first fella is the Native Language Community Coordination Demonstration Project. And um, I'm sure all of you can see the bullet points in terms of what we want to do under our NLCC. Um, and we'll get into the details. And Mia will tell you why this is different than our Native Language Preservation and Maintenance Grants, as well as our Esther Martinez Immersion Grant. But I wanted to tell you how we came to this particular project. I'd have to say probably in my second year as a commissioner, I had the opportunity to go out and visit the Fort Belknap community in Montana and was one of the speakers at the tribal college's commencement ceremonies as well as uh, the Immersion Charter School graduation. And while I was there uh, for that short time, I realized that the Head Start Center was across the street from the Tribal College, and they had immersion uh, language activities. The K-8 Charter School was actually located on the Tribal College and University's campus. Um, the kids were going to have to go off-site to uh, a public school for their 9 through 12 education. And then the Tribal College and University also had language activities. And while all of these schools were in close proximity to each other and worked um, sometimes in partnership, there wasn't a real clear path for a parent or a family who wanted to send their kid to a Head Start that had immersion language activities um, to ensure that that kid would be able to receive their education completely in their native language through the K through 12 system and uh, once they graduate and enter an institution of higher education uh, to continue their studies uh, while receiving an, a language um, uh, education in their native language. And I knew that that Fort Belknap wasn't the only community that was similarly situated, that there were lots of different either um, school-based or community-based language work that was happening, but that it wasn't always all the way connected. And so what we're hoping to be able to do with this demonstration project is allow for a community to come in and say, you know, we have an early childhood education center that does language work. We have a K through 12 or pieces of the K through 12 that are doing language. And we have an institution of higher learning, whether it's a tribal college and university or a satellite campus of another institution um, that we work with regularly or partner with. Um, but we haven't had the ability to really bring all our partners together and talk about what a seamless continuum of education will look like based in our native language. And th we'll get into the specifics about why this is different. Um, you know, it's a five-year program. It'll be a cooperative agreement. And like who all the partners will need to be. But I just wanted to give folks an understanding of how we came to this place for the Native Language Community Coordination Demonstration Project. Now, if you recall, last year, President Obama's budget request was for $50 million 
for ANA, and that's the highest um, budget request that we had ever received um, at that time. And uh, Congress passed, and that $3.5 million increase is to support our Native Language Community Coordination Demonstration Project, as well as our new Native Youth I Lead FOA. And so the Native Youth I Lead, um, let me see if I can get it to go. So the Native Youth I Lead Fall, and as you can see, it's uh, I Lead is stands for Initiative for Leadership, Empowerment, and Development. It's really an opportunity for us to build upon the White House Generation Indigenous activities. Uh, if you recall, last summer, last July, the White House held a Native Youth Summit here in Washington D.C. Well, well. Oh, where well over 1,000 youth uh, came out and participated. And uh, what I can tell you is that there were a number of events uh, that led up to the White House Native Youth Summit, including some generation indigenous activities that were kicked off um, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, youth were challenged to do or accept the White House uh, youth challenge, which was to identify um, an issue in their community and design an approach to be able to um, uh, tackle that or address that particular issue and to, help and to make a real impact in that community. And we wanted to make sure that ANA continued to support what our Native youth started with their generation indigenous um, uh, enthusiasm and, and, and to build upon the momentum and, and what they learned in DC and what they brought back home and what folks have been able to uh, talk about in their communities with regards to Native youth. And so we um, have been able to design and develop another cooperative agreement, uh, which as you can see now is the Native youth I lead, that will really, really be focused on what the Native youth have identified for themselves is what they need in their communities, um, what resources they need, what additional training they might need, what additional educational or career opportunities would help them uh, to uh, build resilience, to help strengthen their identity as Native people, and to help with their leadership skills. And so um, me, again, will go into what some of the specifics are about the Native youth I lead, why it's different than a said or competition that is geared towards Native youth. Um, we, we really, really are, are looking for high levels of participation from Native youth in the development of this FOA, as well as, as well as participation in the review and selection of what is funded under this particular competition. So I just wanted to um, share with folks how we got to our two new FOAs and to let them know that our president's um, the budget that he proposed, the $50 million with the, with the $3.5 million increase, will the, be used to support these two new FOAs. Uh, and that if we get the president's budget that's requested for this current fiscal year, which is $53.1 million, that we will be able to use that funding to continue uh, to award new grants in the Native Youth I lead as well. Uh, one thing that I want to stress is that um, particularly for the native language uh, community coordination is that um, we know for sure sir, we know for sure that we will be funding it um, or having the competition I should say this year I cannot say what the next commissioner will do um, but we know for certain for the native language community coordination that we will have a competition for one year so this might be the one time for folks who want to get in on this demonstration project to be able to do that. For the Native Youth I lead, uh, I believe the plan is to be able to award new grants um, on a yearly basis, um, especially if we get our president's budget passed this year, which proposes additional funding for the Native Youth I lead activities. Um, but really, if folks are interested in the Native Language Community Coordination, they say, well, we want to spend some time to think about how to do this, and maybe we'll apply next year. That competition may not be available next year. So I just want to stress that uh, for communities and tribes and organizations that are thinking about applying, so please really um, begin pulling the stuff together necessary to apply this year. 
So thank you, Matt, for giving me the opportunity to share my enthusiasm about these two new fellows. And at this time, I'm going to turn the call back over to you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, as some of you did notice, the, the content on that last slide was um, incorrect. It was listing content from the existing slide. And so um, the actual content will be provided to you in the follow-up PowerPoint that we'll send out after this webinar. Um, but you know, thank you again to Commissioner um, for her professionalism and for that background. Um, and so now I'd, I'd like to feature um, Mia Strickland um, as a director of the Division of Program Operations. Mia Strickland plays an integral role in coordinating and overseeing the drafting of the two new FOAs. Um, you know, in coordination with a team of dedicated and talented ANA staff members. Um, Ms. Strickland has more than 15 years of professional experience in the financial assistance fields and previously held positions at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, uh, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and the, uh, in the Office of the Secretary. Uh, she's gained invaluable experience in grant management and operations while working in the private sector at the American Indian Higher Education Consortium a nonprofit organization representing the nation's tribal colleges and universities, and CSR Incorporated, a government contractor. She is a member of the Lumbee Tribe of North Carolina and has one son who graduated from high school in 2012. She's the oldest daughter of W.J. and Barbara Strickland, both enrolled members of the Lumbee Tribe. And we are happy to have Ms. Strickland here today to lead us through the details of these new FOAs. Um, so without further ado, I'll pass it on to her. Thank you, Mia. Thank you, Matt. Um, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, wherever you're calling from to join us today. Um, my name is Mia Strickland, um, but if you ever send me an email, it's Carmia Strickland. So um, I apologize. I, I came down with a cold overnight, so I don't sound like my normal self. So bear with me, and I'll do the best I can to get us through. Uh, the information about our two new FOAs. First, we're going to talk about the Native Language Community Coordination Demonstration Project. Uh, we'll refer to it as NLCC. As you know, in the government, we love acronyms. Um, but that also helps us uh, get through the information a little quicker, too, because it's a very long title. The NLCC will fund projects to support communities that can demonstrate success in offering a continuum of native language instruction from early childhood through post-secondary education. So projects that would um, go under NLCC is we would like to build upon our short-term project-based outcomes that we've been able to uh, uh, achieved through our preservation and maintenance, and as well as our Esther Martinez Immersion Grants. Um, there's been a lot of uh, interest in having five-year projects, so this is an opportunity to see what uh, a long-term investment in one community um, could be able to achieve. NLCC also addresses gaps in the native language continuum from early childhood to post-college career language training. NLCC will also be supported, will make the grant awards through cooperative agreements. Uh, and this is a demonstration project um, that would demonstrate what it might look like if we're able to make an investment in a community. What would that potential to integrate all levels of native language education look like? So we're excited uh, at the beginning and then throughout this whole project to see how these uh, communities change with the native language. The expected funding for NLCC is $1.5 million. We expect to make four awards with these resources. Um, of course, the amount of awards will always be based on uh, the, the funding requests that come through the application. So $100,000 to $400,000 would be awarded per budget period for these awardees. And the average award we project would be around $300,000 annually. There are some unique uh, things about this FOA. First of all, this is the first time 
ANA has been able to uh, announce a funding opportunity under our new CFDA number, 93.340. This, this uh, CFDA number was recently um, achieved because there is language in the Native American Programs Act which provides for uh, the commissioner to um, make awards for demonstration, research, and pilot projects. So this is the first time we've used this number. Uh, and so the good thing about that is it doesn't overlap any preservation and maintenance or for any awards. So if you are a recipient of those awards, you can still get a, an NLCC award as well. We anticipate um, all these projects will be 60 months in duration, which is five years. And they will be budgeted um, with a 12-month budget period. So there will be a total of five 12-month budget periods. NLCT projects do require them to be site-based partnerships. Uh, we want to see letters of support as part of the application package um, that shows and demonstrates that there will be um, native language instruction at all education levels from preschool to elementary, middle school, high school, and then on to post-secondary. We did not prescribe that these be in Head Start, nor did we prescribe that they are in tribal colleges. So whatever institutions are within your community that can um, uh, be used as a resource, um, that is, we've been very broad and not being, and not being prescriptive about that. Because we know that all the communities are different. Um, <clears throat> as you mentioned, these are going to be awarded as collaborative agreements, which is also a departure from just a grant. Um, Collaborative agreements, by definition, mean higher level of involvement with the federal government. So we will be also your partners in implementing these grant awards. And some of those um, extra levels of effort that we will be providing to the NLCC grantees includes a kickoff meeting um, with the cohort, as well as the uh, project team that's going to be working with these grantees. We will provide ongoing evaluation, data collection, and capacity building. Um, we will work with you towards jointly establishing what the outcomes will, we hope to achieve for these demonstration projects. And then we will um, annually convene these grantees as a cohort so that they can share best practices amongst themselves. And hopefully with our other language grantees as well. So here's just a few ideas, and I think these are described in the FOA as well. Um, some projects activities to consider um, would be perhaps to establish community project evaluation metrics to develop some sustainable partnerships across the various educational sites, um, to develop tribal state policies to support language coordination to work with your federal, state, and local agencies um, using alternative assessments um, for culture and language-based exceptions, and to modify teacher licensing and certifications that meet your institutional, state, and federal requirements, um, as well as to align the curricula across the various educational uh, continuum. So, this is just a slide to help you understand um, perhaps the difference between NLCC and some of our other programming that we have available at ANA. Projects um, that are interested in recording native language usage for preservation purposes, um, we would recommend that you should consider the our native language preservation and maintenance um, funding opportunity. And if your community is focused on establishing a language nest at one single grade level, then the Esther Martinez Immersion Funding Opportunity is more suitable for that type of um, grant. And then a project supporting or preserving cultural practices where instruction does not take place primarily in a native language. Um, that might be an art type project, uh, uh, like a carding. Uh, projects, that might be more suitable for our SED program, our sustainable employment, um, sustainable and economic development strategies 
funding opportunity. So we do apologize if there was any confusion about uh, the other slide. Um, but always refer to the follow for more details and, and, and information. We will update those slides uh, and make them not available just to per, uh, the registrants for today's uh, webinar, but also on our ANA website as well. So these are some key dates you want to keep in mind for NLCC. The applications are due on June the 1st at 11.59 p.m. And that's really uh, if you're submitting your application, which most everyone does through grants.gov because the system shuts off at 11.59 p.m. Anything submitted after that time is considered late because it's into the next day. This funding opportunity was published on March the 18th, just a few weeks ago. And we have asked for a letter of intent. It is optional. Um, and it's due on April the 15th, 2016. And that's really so that uh, ANA can better plan how many applications we expect to receive. Since this is the first time we've offered this competition, we're not really sure how many applications to um, expect. And we have to line up the reviewers who are going to read them and, and, have them plan, and plan the panel process. So this is really going to help us um, plan and prepare for the actual review of these applications. And now that brings me to our Native Youth Initiative for Leadership, Empowerment, and Development, I lead, is how we'll talk about this fellow moving forward. So the I lead has, um, funding opportunity seeks to fund community-based projects that support and empower Native youth to address priorities identified by those youth, as well as to develop models, approaches, and strategies to foster resiliency and build upon our Native youth's inherent capacity to thrive. We want to be able to incorporate Native wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Uh, and all the projects should be youth-centered as well as youth-driven. Um, and we define youth in this FOA as those that are between the ages of 14 and 24 years old. This age range mirrors what uh, the Gen I focus has been as well. These projects will also be supported by cooperative agreements. Um, and I think we'll get a little bit more involved in explaining that later. But there are basically four domains of activity that can be um, pursued under IV. All of these factors really help support Native youth to thrive and, and be successful um, for the better tomorrow. So those four areas are Native youth leading. So leadership skills and development can be um, under that domain. Native youth learning promotes educational success and appropriateness. Native youth connecting is to help build positive self-identity of our youth, uh, help to engage the youth to be more involved with their community, so community connection, and also support the social and emotional health of our youth. And Native youth working will help develop positive work habits, working in groups, uh, being mentored, and thriving in public service. So the expected funding level for IVED is also $1.5 million. Um, but because the budget ceiling is a little lower, um, up to $300,000, we expect to make a few more awards under this funding opportunity. And, and um, so the average award for we believe, and this is just a projection, will be $287,000. So um, IWE does have the same CFCA number that ANA uses for our social and economic development strategies program, as well as our SEED program. Um, in fact, NAVI and SESA K also have the same CFCA number, 93.612. But in this funding opportunity, we did exempt the limitation of 
award the grantee could have um, using that same CFCA number. So if you have an existing SED, SEED, NAVI, or SED AK, you can also receive an ILEED um, award. And that's really just because we didn't want the fact that you already had an existing award to inhibit your ability to receive something to help your native youth. These projects are going to be funded for either 48 or 60 months. So this is a longer duration as well from our, our usual three-year projects that we fund under SED. And uh, you must target the native population of, of young people ages 14 to 24 in your project. As I mentioned, these are cooperative agreements. And we anticipate that there will be um, <clears throat> more involvement in the execution of these grant awards and more supportive services provided to these grantees. And that will include specialized training on establishing needs assessments, helping you with other planning, capacity building, and data collection, as well as evaluation. So we really want to, again, work more hand-in-hand -hand collaboratively with um, these grantees. And you will also be working with our training and technical assistance centers, as well as another team of ANA um, program specialists and uh, members of the other divisions at ANA that will be working hand in hand with these cohort of grantees. Some things that are right for ILEAD include under um, youth leading. Peer role models, um, community builders would be, um, and then policy development and Gen I initiatives. Under Native Youth Connecting, those, those things include um, projects to create models of resiliency, foster the development of a strong sense of identity, and to develop skills to cope and manage with challenges. We want to be able to. Um, establish and reconnect traditional healing or develop culturally responsive parenting resources. These are things that are, you can find in the BOA itself about what each of these domains include. Uh, but they're not, as we, we never say, it has to be exclusive to the ideas that a a comes up. We really want the youth to decide what it is that they want and need and what the community can support. We just ask that they focus on these four domains. And the other domain is uh, Native Youth Learning, Defining and Influencing School Success, what it's like to live in two worlds, both the contemporary world as well as their traditional world. And then workforce um, working, how do we prepare our young people for tomorrow's workforce? Um, and maybe they want to establish some businesses. Um, and the data champion is really maybe training them on how they can be um, connecting them through use apprenticeships and other models uh, in the field of technology research and evaluation so that they can develop their skills and knowledge to design and improve tribal data and other systems that they'll be able to um, uh, better identify trends in their own communities. So what kinds of projects are not right for ILE? Uh, these might be projects that are focused on just the general community-wide social or economic development um, activities. So we don't want to, well, regular sites should be able to provide for those types of projects. These types of projects have to be more focused just on the younger people. Uh, for projects that are looking to create full-time employment that would combat poverty, while those are laudable projects, you should look at our SEED program to um, fund those efforts. And then if the community is looking to start a new language fluency program, then we, again, suggest that you look at our other funding opportunities. And we have three of them that support language development, preservation and maintenance, as to Martita's immersion, and the NLCC as well. 
So if you are um, some approaches to consider when developing an application might be to ensure that your, your projects are working from a strength base rather than an F, um, deficit based type strategy. And we also want to uh, have projects that are youth led and youth -led driven. Perhaps a peer mentorship model would help promote your projects. We want to encourage traditional knowledge to support the modern life. Uh, we want projects that also have supportive adults and encourage intergenerational engagement. How do we connect our young people to our elders and give them those opportunities to, to um, connect? As well as uh, empowerment and positive self-image and, and well-being, making our young people more proud and strong and healthy. So the, here are some key dates. For um, ILEAD, the funding opportunity announcements was just published last week on March the 22nd. And the applications will be due on June the 13th, again at 11.59 Eastern. We've noticed a discrepancy between the actual content of this funding opportunity announcement inside the announcement. It is, is, um, Listed as April the 13th, I believe, as the due date. Um, so there was an error when the, this actual funding opportunity was published. We're aware of it, and we're making the correction right now. We do intend to change the due date to April the 21st. And as Lillian mentioned, we are actively and currently recruiting young people to read our application specific to IV because we want to get their um, take on, on these applications as well. So if you know of a young person that you think would be um, suitable, I think we're targeting youth 21 to 24 years old to read these, because uh, they will have to travel to Washington, D.C. to read these grant applications. Um, the website is right there for uh, how to become an ANA reviewer. And so in summary, ILEAD is our new funding opportunity announcement to develop and to support Native youth leaders. The projects are four to five years in duration. We're targeting youth that are ages 14 to 24 in their community. And the focus of the project should be on leading, learning, collab collaborating. Actually, I think that's supposed to be connecting and working. And then for our native language um, community coordination demonstration project in LCC, we hope to um, connect the language education continuum within these communities. These will be five-year projects. And uh, as Lillian mentioned, we're not sure if this opportunity will be available in the future. Partnerships will be developed at all levels of the education continuum from preschool to post-secondary. And projects include, or parts of the elements of the project should include planning, curriculum development, assessment, teacher certification, coordination, and even building the gap, or how, how that gap between the education continuum can be bridged. So I'm finished talking for now. And that's the end of my um, my presentation. I believe we're going to turn it back over to Matt for um, a, to moderate our Q and A session. Thank you very much, Mia. Um, so we have about uh, 15 minutes for Q and A, and we have some questions um, in the chat box already. Um, so the first. Question um, comes from Sherilyn Young, um, and Sherilyn asks, is there funding for a five-year project? Um, earlier, the presenter said NLCC may only be funded for one year. How should we proceed? Uh, so could you clarify the um, funding period for NLCC, please, Mia? Um, sure. So um, what I think what was 
not clear is we're not sure if there will be future funding, future FOAs for NLCC. This may be a one-time um, funding opportunity because we're um, not sure what the next commissioner uh, will want to do. But um, but this project, those projects that get funded under this funding opportunity will be funded for five years in duration. So there will be a five-year project period for anyone who receives the NLCC grant this year. All right, thank you, Mia. Um, <clears throat> so the next question um, comes from Holly Rustic. Um, Holly asks, does the ILEAD program have to encompass all ages from 14 to 24, or can it be any of those ages in that range, for example, 18 through 24-year-olds? Um, I think that's a good question. What we wanted to do was just sort of provide a range of what we meant by um, Use, but I think it's based on whatever your project design or, or focus is going to be. I think as long as it's within that range, um, then that's acceptable. Um, the next question comes from Helen, who asks, um, "What does the same CFDA number as said seeds, but exempt from lim limitation, mean?" And I can answer that. Um, ANA has a limitation on um, the number of grants you can hold under a single CFDA number. So usually you can't hold more than a, um, one project at any one time um, under a CFDA number. But even though um, you know the new iLead program shares the same CFDA number as both SEDS and SEEDS, um, it's exempt from that normal limitation. So you are able to hold two projects simultaneously under that same CFDA number. Um, and ANA did this in order to encourage more um, applicants um, in this new initiative. Um, and if you have anything to add to that, you can add on to that, Mia. Um, no, I just think that covers it. it yeah, so ANA just has this administrative policy where we limit the number of awards. Um, and that's so that uh, we can uh, get more communities to have these awards rather than the same community getting multiple awards um, for the same types of CFDA projects, CFDA number projects. But we made an exception for ILE. All right, thank you. Um, so the next question um, kind of comes from three individuals, uh, Paula, Amy, and Catherine. And their question has to do with the areas of interest for iLead. So um, they ask, you know, do, does, does a good iLead project need to address all four of these domains, or could you just focus on one of them? I think this is the realm of projects that we're looking to fund, but I don't think we're, we haven't said you have to do all four of these, uh, but certainly, and so then this is where your youth need to come into play in terms of what it is they're looking to do and hoping to achieve. So as long as it's around those four domains, uh, whether it's one, two, three, or all four, I think that's up to the community to decide. Right, right, based on that um, youth-led and driven philosophy. Um, thank you, Mia. Um, and the next question comes from Valric Welch. Um, Valric says that his project is for fourth and fifth grade students um, who would continue with the project, making them 15 to 16 years old by the end of the funding um, period. So would this age group be eligible to grow into that eligible age group? I would say we're trying to target youth that are currently, but um, in that range from 14 to 24 years old. But you know, again, this is our first time doing this. Um, so it would be, we don't make these final decisions as to which projects get funded. As you know, there is a competitive 
uh, objective panel review process. Um, so we'd have to uh, put it through the panel and see what their um, take is on that as well. So it's actually, this is Lillian. And so let me just clarify that you know we want to stay within. Um, the target that Generation Indigenous has been targeting, which is that 14 to 24 year age group. Do youth younger than age 14 need these same types of services? Absolutely. I mean, we, we, we recognize that we want to begin building resiliency and strength and interventions and preventions from adverse childhood, ex childhood experiences as soon as possible. But this competition really is designed for that 14 to 24 year old age group. Um, you, if you have something for a younger age group, what I would suggest is, and it might be too late this year, is to design something that would fit under set. Because these types of projects could also, um, it would be different. It wouldn't be a cooperative agreement. It wouldn't be for five years. But the activities could still be funded under set for youth ages under 14. Um, what would be good, though, um, Valerick, is if you could send a letter of intent and indicate the age group. And this is for anyone who's looking for, for someone outside of that age range, because that will give us an indicator of what we need to change or tweak for next year's FOA. So if we need to expand or have a separate competition for uh, youth under age 14 or kids or children under youth age 14 um, because there's a need, then we would like to know that. Um, so if you could please send that, at least a letter of intent in. Um, with that information, that would be helpful for us to be able to track and monitor. Uh, thank you very much, um, Lillian and Mia. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, those those letters are going to be due um, mid-April. So um, that would be uh, the 21st for ILEAD and on the 15th for NLCC. <clears throat> Um, okay, uh, the next question comes from Jackie, um, and this is regarding the um, youth panel reviewers. Um, so uh, Jackie asks for the age, um, which I think was defined earlier, but if, um, if you could uh, uh, provide a, maybe a little more background on the need for youth reviewers, that might be um, useful. Because these are applications that are designed to meet the youth needs and are to be uh, heavily driven and developed with youth, um, we find it necessary to make sure that youth are also involved in the review of these applications. Uh, we are asking, as Mia mentioned, for you know targeting youth ages 21 to 24. Or because they will be coming to Washington, D.C., um, we, know we will not be able to pay for a chaperone or for parents or for other folks to come in. But we really need youth that will, be, will have uh, you know, strong reading and writing skills, um, have a strong initiative and are self-starters. So if we send them an application, we know that they will read them before they come here. And um, we'll be able to um, operate unsupervised. Um, so if you have youth that fall uh, within those parameters and are 18 or 19, please feel free to still send us their information. But we do need um, at least one youth reviewer on each panel um, as we make these selections. They will be compensated, and their travel and accommodations will be taken care of. Great. Thank you, Lillian. Um, okay, so the next question comes from Paula Made, um, and the question is: How is ANA defining what a local community project is? Um, and I think this might, you know, be addressing both the um, community-driven project concept as well as um, the specific community demonstration project aspect of. Um, the NLCC grant and what constitutes a community for the demonstra demonstration purposes. Can you repeat that, the first part of the question? 
is ANA defining what a local community project is? So maybe one of our T and TA providers can actually assist in answering this question because I'm sure this is um, asked frequently and this isn't new to our NLCC or to our um, I leave fellows. This is actually something that we require among all of our projects is that they address community needs. And so I know there are tools and that there are other um, uh, resources that are TA providers. So Matt, I'm going to ask you or Napua to uh, provide some assistance in terms of how applicants can really demonstrate that. So, you know, really key to ANA's project development um, philosophy is this idea of, you know, um, having the project being community driven. And so in your application, you're expected to actually provide evidence of some community planning process. Um, so a lot of times that might be, you know, that might take place in a series of community meetings where you convene members of the community to be served to discuss the problems they're facing um, to, you know, get some ideas on how those problems could be addressed, um, and then really to gain buy-in from the community um, from the get-go, so that you're working with that community to empower themselves. Um, another way to do it is through a series of surveys, um, in which you'll qualify respondents as being native um, eligible members of the community to be served, and then using that survey data to inform your problem statement and project design. Um, in terms of the NLCC um, community demonstration project, um, it's following the same concept. Um, in terms of what the local community is, um, that's primarily going to be defined by the educational continuum that you are um, attempting to connect through this uh, demonstration project. And so you're going to need to have partnerships from all members of the educational continuum from you know, pre-K to K-12 um, through, um, you know, post high school and into career track as well. And you're going to need to have actual letters supporting partnerships. Um, and so that's going to constitute the local aspect of the, um, the community, the way that the community to be served would be defined in terms of an NLCC project specifically. But otherwise, like, uh, like the commissioner said, the um, community-based aspect of your project design is fundamental to all ANA um, projects. Okay, uh, the next um, the next question comes from UK, um, and this is regarding ILE. And so um, UK asks, can a youth project serve um, 14 to 18 year old youth only, or 20 to 24 year old um, year old youth only? Um, or is it both? And this might be, um, you know, maybe a sub-question here would be, um, you know, regarding um, serving youth who are legal minors and youth who are legal adults um, and the implications that might have. So um, either of you could address that. Um, I, I would say I think we did earlier respond to a similar question that if they want, as long as it's within the ages of 14 to 24 years old, if they want to do a subset of that range, um, because it's better aligned with their project design and what they intend to do, I think that's acceptable, yes. All right, thank you, Mia. Um, and you know, and if you are working with minors, um, some of your staff may need to gain um, background, you know, get background checks or gain clearance in order to work with youth as well. Um, so, if anyone has any more questions, you can type it in now. I think we have time for one more question before we close out this session. Uh, Matt, it looks like there's a question from Luana Scanlon. Um, she says, the FOAL is not very clear. Are government department agencies eligible to apply? I'm not exactly sure what she means by a government department. Um, <clears throat> oh, this will probably be uh, American Samoa. Is this American Samoa? In American Samoa. Uh, so we have funded um, entities of the territorial government, as long as the projects are focused and working directly with the native peoples of those 
community. So the Guam is not just everyone in Guam, but it would focus on the um, Chamorro people, the project. So, so yes, uh, we have um, funded projects um, from the governments of these other territories, but the projects should be focused on the indigenous people of those communities. Thanks, Mia, and and thanks for letting me know about that question because I see that a bunch more came in since I <laughs> last scrolled down. Um, so maybe let's okay. spend a couple more minutes addressing some of these questions, especially the ones that are specific to these programs. Um, so maybe let me start with Nalu Barrett. Um, so Nalu's question starts with, uh, will the requirements for cooperative agreements be similar to other ANA grants from the past? Um, and will the required documentation be more extensive than other ANA grants in the past? Which question was that, man? I'm sorry. Maybe we could start with um, the required documentation, um, and the you know, and and the required. Maybe we'll, we'll combine them to say, uh, will the required documentation and uh, work required under the cooperative agreement be more extensive than what was required from a, &A grantees in past um, initiatives? So the, the, co the, the we'll be working more hand in hand with the um, recipients uh, under the cooperative agreement. Um, and um, so they're asking is more documentation needed. I'm not sure exactly what they mean by that question. Um, but okay, we, let me try to maybe what? answer some of that. So, so in, a, in a word, yes. And the reason being is that we want to build an evidence base for both native language programming as well as um, youth programming that is related to resilience. And so as Mia mentioned, these are cooperative agreements. So we will be, we will be working with you in partnership to help develop um, what uh, the evaluations will look like um, to help build the capacity with the grantees to uh, develop their own data, analyze their own data, collect their own data, um, and and decide what it is they would like to be able to measure. So all of that will help lead to again creating uh, you know an evidence and practice based. Um, um, a body to demonstrate that these programs and these models do work. So more documentation in terms of reporting, in terms of recording, and, and, and showing what it is that you're doing, yes. More documentation with regards to the application, um, in some sense, yes. I mean, you'll need to be able to demonstrate partnerships uh, with your early childhood, K through 12, and higher education education systems for the NLCC, uh, you'll need to be able to document that the youth are um, have been actively involved in the development of this project under the Native Youth I Lead, and so there is some different documentation that is required uh, under both of those new fellows new programs, but they're different. These are different competitions with different requirements. All right, thank you very much, Lillian. Um, I think, uh, OK, our, our last question will be from Consuela Richardson. I mean, everyone else who had a question, uh, I'll follow up with you individually and um, email you an answer to your question um, using the email address that you registered with. Um, but the last specific question comes from Consuela Richardson. If the data proves that college financing is a barrier, could ILE be a mechanism to provide stipends, book funds, or scholarships to encourage students to go to college and return to work in their tribal community? So you could design a project to address that, but what we're not really looking to do is provide pass through funding to the tribes to do stipends or book scholarships or other types of scholarships. These are really designed to be programs that, again, are about building resiliency, uh, demonstrating the educational success 
uh, uh, other education, I'm just these are just examples I'm coming up with, it, showing increase in high school graduation rates. But we would like to be able to see a program that is able to bring students back into the community to help fill the gaps in the void in that community, um, to be able to develop grow your own types of educational programs. Uh, I don't know that book funds or scholarships or stipends would even necessarily be considered uh, competitive enough against a lot of the other programs that are coming in. And again, you would have to demonstrate that the youth have identified this is what is needed to be able to go away to school and to come back. Um, so I would say work with the TTA providers, uh, Consuela, um, in the Eastern region to maybe think through some of what could be done under the leading or learning component under the ILEAD. Oh, thank you, Lillian. That was a, a great example um, to clarify the types of projects that we're looking for with ILEAD. Um, so that's going to be all the time that we have for questions. Like I said, I will address each individual question um, with you after the session. Uh, we're also recording this webinar, so a transcribed version of the webinar recording will be posted to YouTube in about a week and a half, and um, we'll send that recording um, to everyone who registered using the email address that you registered with. Um, and so before we close, I just want to point out some resources that you might be interested in. Um, for more details on ANA's initiatives, um, including the two new ones that you just heard about, you'll want to visit the ANA website, specifically the programs page. Um, their website is there listed on the screen, www.acf.hhs.gov slash programs slash ANA. And um, you'll be able to uh, browse through their website there for lots of great resources. Um, to find the actual funding opportunities, you want to go to the Funding Opportunities page on the ANA website, um, also known as the FOAs. And that's really the document that you want to become super familiar with if you're planning on applying for any of these grants. Um, so you want to, right after this um, session, go download your FOA. If you have any questions, contact your regional um, TTA center. Um, and to apply for one of these grants, um, application session is now open, um, and grants will be due in June. Um, you'll want to go to grants.gov. Because the ILEAD uh, initiative shares the same CFDA number as SEDS and SEEDS, um, if you really want to make sure that you're searching for the right program, then you'll want to search by the FOA number. Um, which I listed on screen there, but you'll also see in the um, the FOA once you download that. So we have a few upcoming webinars that you might be interested in. Um, today's session was a good overview of both of ANA's new funding initiatives, um, but we're going to have two more webinars um, each. Each one will focus specifically on one of the new initiatives. Um, so we're going to have an ILEAD focused webinar. Uh, we'll have an NLCC focused webinar. And then we'll have one um, focused specifically on how to create logic models. Um, logic models are going to be required um, for uh, some of the new application procedures. So. Um, the dates and times for these sessions have not been announced yet, um, but these are going to be very much in demand. So to stay updated um, when they are announced, you want to visit the events page on the ANA website. Um, alternatively, you can visit your local TTA center websites, which I've listed there on screen. Um, we have four TTA centers. The Eastern region serves um, the eastern half of the continental U.S., uh, the Western serves the Western half. Then we have Alaska and the Pacific. Um, you can see their website URLs there on screen. Um, in addition to looking at their upcoming trainings and webinars, you might also want to subscribe to your region's email listserv um, for regular updates. 
Um, okay, sorry, you might not have seen that on screen. And uh, so thank you very much for joining us for today's session. Um, my name, once again, is Matthew Ng. Uh, this session is being recorded. Um, we will be posting the recording um, to YouTube soon. Um, listed on screen is my contact information as well as a toll free um, our toll free number uh, feel free to call us if you have any follow-up questions we also listed the number for um, ANA's OATS department formerly known as the help desk um, there on screen one eight seven seven nine two two nine two six two thank you very much again for joining us for today's National ANA webinar introducing two new ANA FOAs, uh, ILEAD and NLCC. This has been a resource of the Administration for Native Americans presented by Ka'anani O, operators of the Pacific Region TTA Center. Thank you for joining us and aloha.